Good morning, and welcome to my friend the Rainbow Circle. I had wanted to shoot uh, on the first day of October, as the sun was rising, but it's very overcast, so it's not going to have the dramatic effect that I wanted. Um, but I wanted to talk about opening lines. Oh, the places you'll go. <laughs> the places you'll go. I wanted to talk about opening lines in books. That was a study I did. Um... When I worked in a bookstore 20 years ago, I went through all the books and not every single book, there were thousands, but I went through all the books and looked at the opening lines um, to see what really made for good open, an op good opening line. Um, and I saw a pattern of opening lines that, that um, were really compelling. I really used two techniques that um, are similar for and work for similar reasons. Um, uh, and the dogs might start making a lot of noise way too early in the morning, so I'll have to put them inside the house. Um, but the two techniques that I that I found just as a pattern for really compelling opening lines, not the only not the only way to do a good opening line, but just two really good techniques for for doing an, a good opening line, a good compelling opening line. Um, I I don't have my I don't have my Thomas Hardy books here, but Thomas Hardy starts with a really really in depth description usually. Um, so Return of the Native is just deep, deep description. Um, um, but the other two techniques that I saw as patterns that work really well uh, are parataxis, which I've talked about before. Um, I think um, Allen Ginsberg uh, describes it best in, in Howl, who trapped the archangel of the soul between two visual images. Um, he, he, he describes it a couple of different times. He calls it the eyeball kick, but... Um, Leaping towards uh, poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Um, parataxis um, is the juxtaposition of images or juxtaposition of two things that don't really belong together. And it drives the reader to try to fill in the blanks. Um, the other one, is, which is directly connected, I call it elision. It's, uh, I don't know if elision is really the best word for it. But elision is where you, where you simply leave something out. So it might be the juxtaposition of two things that don't belong together, or simply leaving something out um, that drives the reader to try to fill in the blank. And I talked about this. This is um, what led me to believe that that Malcolm Gladwell had better writing advice than Neil Gaiman did, because he talked about the um, doing puzzles and leaving out a piece. The, the piece that you leave out drives you to, you know, uh, fill the piece in. Um, and it doesn't matter if you actually fill the piece in or not. It's just the, the drive, to, drive to fill the piece in. And so the sort of opening line, and I, I also I wanted to do this when I was starting my story, Giants of the Symbol Earth, because I was going to parallel the development of that story with, with stuff I talk about on this show. I'm going to start another another story today about undulates, and I'm probably called undulates. I talked about picking titles. I don't have a first. I don't have a good first line for that one. For undulates, um, the first line for um, Giants of this Humble Earth was my character Old God talking about you know memories of these weird giants that he's known over the years, and so you know that's sort of foreshadowing of later. That's the st what the story is going to be connecting with all these giants in his past um, in sort of a support group type of thing. Um, but I don't have an opening line for um, undulates yet. But the kind of opening line that the person I stole the most opening lines from or the technique or the structure is Kafka. Most famously, um, this is my basic Kafka. This is my first ever Kafka book. First ever Kafka book. Um, but the metamorphosis, there, there are a lot of different translations of the structure of this sentence. So whenever I quote it, um, I tend to say, um, Gregor found himself into a monstrous vermin and transformed. My, th this one just says, as Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from an uneasy dream, he found himself transformed into his bed, into a gigantic in insect. Um... And that's juxtaposing a lot of different things. The image of just a dude in his bed, the image of a giant insect or a monstrous vermin. 
the translation I prefer is Munster Spurman. Um, the tone of the importance of the the event versus the you know the um, the seemingly uh, placing the importance on the unsettling dreams part of it. So it's paratactical in that the parts don't really seem to fit together. So that urges the reader to try to fit them together. Um, and that's what you do in the whole story, and that's what you do in the whole or whole book. Um, try to drive the reader to um, fit the parts together or fill in the blanks or figure out how two things fit together. Um, arguably... <laughs> my books are falling. I took these off my, my favorites shelf. Um, I shoot in front of my my C shelf, um, usually. I took these off my A shelf. And of course, 100 Years of Solitude does a similar thing. You know, you could put those, these two lines side by side as two of the most famous versions of that. Many years, uh, many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel, Colonel Aurelio Buendia, I talked to my Ecuadorian um, stepmother about how to pronounce that, and I might have forgotten the actual right pronunciation. Sorry. Um, sorry, Patty. Um, was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover the ice. So, you know, he has this really, what should seem like it's important. Um, but it's also an example of Belizean in that he's about, he's about to be executed. So, you know, you're drawing the reader in by wondering, <laughs> of course my phone falls. You're drawing the reader in to wonder, um, you know, what did he do to be executed? And you have a lot of really, really compelling opening lines that'll do something like that. Um, I was about to be murdered, and I was about to be killed. I was about to... <laughs> um, I heard about this murder. You know, I heard about this mystery. I heard about this, you know, really important thing. Um, and Garcia Marquez is, is contrasting that with um, contrasting that with, you know, m what we would see as the mundane discovery of ice. Anyway, very famous opening line. Kafka's got lots of great opening lines. I've talked about the hunger artist, how the hunger artist opens. During these last decades, the interest in professional fasting is markedly diminished. So the metamorphosis starts with direct reference to the really unusual element turning into an the insect. Hunger artist, the hunger artist um, does a similar sort of thing in taking for granted the existence of hunger artists and saying it used to be popular and now it's less popular. So it's doing a lot. The dogs are getting loud. The dogs are getting loud. <laughs> Hold on. Oops. Oh my. But anyway, a hunger artist um, does a similar sort of thing where it takes for granted this unusual thing of being a hunger artist. Um, treats it as mundane, um, but and even shows that it used to be popular. It's not popular anymore. So, you know, great opening line. Um, prov provides you with the elision, partly, I mean, a real basic elision of saying it used to be popular, it's not popular anymore. What caused it not to be popular? What is a hunger artist? Why is everyone treating that as a normal thing? Um... Um, one of my favorite underrated Kafka stories is The Bucket Writer. One of my favorite opening lines. Um, I, and, uh, Kafka was somebody I really just grew to love when I worked at that, that bookstore. I read lots and lots of Kafka when I worked in that bookstore. Um, so one of the reasons he's sort of the go-to with opening lines is because of that time working in the bookstore. Um, I discovered things like the bucket, the bucket list. I was vaguely familiar with the metamorphosis at that time, but I discovered, oh, the bucket list is such a, um, the bucket list. Why am I saying bucket list? Th this whole video series is sort of like a bucket list. My bucket list before I die, record all my ideas. Um, the bucket writer, <laughs> jeez, it is early morning. I'm still drinking my coffee. Let me drink a little more coffee. The bucket rider. Coal all spent, the bucket empty, the shovel useless, the stove breathing out cold, 
the room freezing, the leaves outside the window rigid, covered with rime, the sky, all these are little fragments um, combined with semicolons. Um, the sky is silver shield against anyone who looks for help from it. So, <clears throat> the thing about um, characters, I think I, I think I marked Country Doctor. Country Doctor is someone, um, Country Doctor, probably my favorite, probably my favorite Kafka story. Um, but the thing about characters is that the appeal of a character is really rooted in so many irrational subconscious forces that um, um, you can present someone in trouble and there's an automatic appeal, whether or not you sustain it, you know, is, is another thing. Um, you can present just a character who's in danger, like the bucket rider is about to freeze to death. And there's a lot to say about the tone, too. The tone makes it very, very frantic. It's a real short story, so it starts in this very frantic tone. If you're trying to sustain a novel, starting in a super frantic tone is, might not be advisable. Um, like, Marquez starts with this tease that eventually Colonel Buendia is going to get um, executed. So it sets it up for a longer-term story. Um, whereas The Bucket Rider's two pages, I think, something like, like that. The Bucket Rider's two pages start itself. Super frantic. Um, high energy, and you know it's a paradoxus in that he's talking about freezing to death. Um, so it really mimics the the frantic quality of someone trying to remain warm as he's freezing to death. Um, but anyway, just the nature of characters is you can do some really basic things to inspire empathy. Really, on the short term, um, you could present any sort of character in danger, and it's going to draw the reader in just automatically, um, like Colonel Bundia, like the bucket rider. Um, you know, whether or not you sustain that, like Colonel Buendia, very, 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 very complicated character. One of my favorite characters, very complicated character. Um, and there's all kinds of, he doesn't sustain necessarily worry for his well-being because of, he does lots of bad things too, but, um, and, you know, there's ghosts and things like that that sort of play around with that expectation of, of him being killed. But just in, if you're trying to compel the reader in one line. Presenting someone in danger with that elision of what is actually causing them danger. What did he actually do to earn execution? Yeah. Like the bucket rider, you know, he's he's just running out of coal and he's going to freeze to death. Um, and it, it's early morning, so there's honking everywhere. And the whole line, um, the, the sky is silver shield against anyone who looks for help from it. So... It sort of gives you a sense of his character, but he's definitely, he's endangered right from the beginning. I mean, it's such a short story, but you still get, just even in that one line, you still get a good sense of his character. A Country Doctor is probably my favorite um, Kafka story. I was in great perplexity. I had to start an urgent journey. A seriously ill patient was waiting for me in a village ten miles off. A thick blizzard of snow filled all the wide spaces between him and me. I had a gig, a light gig. Uh, with big wheels, exactly right for, and this is another one with a bunch of semicolons, right for a country roads, muffled in furs, my bag of instruments in my hand. I was in the courtyard, all ready for the journey, but there was no horse to be had, no horse. So it creates a lot of suspense. The suspense changes just constantly. Um, that's a, it's a, it's a wild story because it sets up expectations at the beginning and it shifts so many different directions. Like the horses are these sinister, godlike characters. You don't expect that, but just the, the nature of um, the nature of an opening line, um, you have a problem that the reader, not knowing anything about the characters, it's presenting a problem that the reader wants to solve. It's presenting a mystery that the reader wants to fill in the blanks. And no, just the nature of Kafka, he doesn't solve the problems, but just presenting that problem, or presenting that mystery, he doesn't solve the mystery, presenting that mystery up front sort of draws you in, and and it's the stimulating, destimulating force. So the stimulating force draws you into this unresolved mystery. The destimulating force draws you um, to want to solve it, to want to fill in the blank, or to want to make a connection between the parataxis, the, you know, the elements in the parataxis. Um, so it's using the natural destimulating um, 
uh, impulse to heighten stimulation. And so ultimately, whether or not you whether or not you resolve that just has much more to do with the end. The, the ending, you may solve the mystery, maybe, maybe not. Um, if you solve the mystery really early on in the story, you have to set up some other form of stimulation um, to take its place. But that opening line can can drive that de- that that destimulating um, impulse to to um, fill in the blank, to make connections, to solve mysteries, to keep people from danger. You know that automatic empathetic sense of danger for a character, danger for yourself. You want to resolve that, and that drives you through the story. Um, <laughs> which one should I pick next? Um, I just grabbed a bunch from my my A shelf. Um, I'll I'll give you an example. Oh, I'll give you a much subtler example. Um, the Fixer. I grabbed ones that were really inspirational to me in some ways. But The Fixer, I think it has just an amazing ending. Um, but the opening is much, much more subtle. Kafka's always going to be really overt. And the Fixer's more realistic. I, you know, I, I, tend to, I tend towards magical realist stuff. Um, um, but it says, from here's my fi- beat, beaten up old copy of The Fixer. From the small crossed window of his room above the stable in the brickyard, Yakov Bach saw people in their long overcoats running somewhere early that morning, everybody in the same direction. So it's about it's about him in jail. Um, he gets caught up in the pogroms. Um, he's Jewish, and he gets caught up in the pogroms in Russia. And he goes through awful, awful torture in jail. Um, and it starts off with him isolated. Everybody else is going some other direction, um, going the, the same direction. And, you know, there's a really animalistic sort of impulse to that. It's real subtle, but it's um, an animalistic impulse. If you, if you see a, a herd, you know, it's the Jurassic Park thing. If you see a herd shifting some way, you have this very animalistic um, response that, you know, maybe there's a predator after them. So it's a great opening line. It's just, it's not nearly as overt about everything as Kafka. Kafka tends to just dump it all up front. Um, let me see. I'll give you one that, I don't think it's a great opening line. I read the, uh, this great book. Heart Snatcher by Boris Vian. Um, and I read it on this patio. <laughs> one of the reasons I grabbed this is because this is this is where I read this book. Um, I don't think it's a great opening line. Even though it is a great book, I don't think it's a great opening line. Let me find it. Um, the path dawdled round the top of the cliff. Okay. <laughs> this kind of meander, meandering opening line has no real hint of, you know, all the, the craziness of other magical realist type of book. It has no hint of the craziness that plays out in the rest of the book. Um, in Watermelon Sugar, Watermelon Sugar, a lot of what Richard Brodigan does is syntactic and, you know, poetic and plays around with repetition. In Watermelon Sugar, the deeds were done and done again as my life is done in watermelon sugar. Um, so, you know, a lot of that is the deeds were done. You know, you'll find opening lines like that. Um, but a lot, it sets the tone of just this weird sort of poetic repetition, weird sort of syntax that um, he's playing around with um, just in that opening line. Um, but, you know, if you if you... Just imagine what sort of character would say say in watermelon sugar over and over again. Um, uh, it gives you a sense of the danger. You know, maybe he's in some. You know, the narrator is in some sort of danger. You know, there's something really aberrant going on here. Um, uh, I grabbed this one. This is no one belongs here more than you. I started writing a series of stories about a character named Greta Stromack. I grabbed ones that were inspirational and I started writing based, inspired by them. As I was reading this book, I started writing a series of stories. There's one called Extra Bright. This one just has a good opening line. (laughs) This is a collection of short stories. And I'm on a patio. So this is the opening line of the story, The Shared Patio. It still counts. 
even though it happened when he was unconscious. <laughs> well, and that's that's lots and lots of elision. You know, if count the number of uh, vague pronouns. But that really draws the end, because you want to fill in everything. It still counts. What does it refer to? Even though it, again, it, um, happened when he was unconscious. What happened? <laughs> Why does it count? Why is he unconscious? Um, so it's that. <laughs> that destimulating function to explain what all those pronouns are. Um, meeting the stimulating function of somebody's, again, somebody's in danger. Um, somebody needs some, some sort of help. Um, oh, here's, this is an opening line. I got, I, I did a presentation in grad school on this book, and I ordered it, and it has signature. I ordered it on, I think, Amazon or something like that. Vaccine Hong Kingston actually signed it. I haven't been saying the names of the books. It says, no one belongs here more than you. This one is Trip Master Monkey. This one is Harp Snatcher by Boris Vian. I would be terrible at booktube. <laughs> One day I want to um, have a booktube channel that is just fake books that I summarize and review. But the Trip Master Monkey by Maxine Hung, Hung, Hung Kingston. She signed it. I didn't meet her, unfortunately. I just happened to order one that magically she had signed. But this is a great opening line. And it's sort of like um, the in watermelon sugar line. Maybe it comes from living in San Francisco, city of clammy humors. And foghorns and worn and worn omen o oh, omen o oh, dolorous men o oh, dolors of omens. So he's um, the trip master monkey, the um, the close third narrator. Um, it sort of slips in in and out. Um, Maxine Hunt Kingsman, um, the guy who calls himself trip master monkey. Um, let me get back, get back to it. So the tone of that close third narrator is sort of manic and all over the place, so it gives you a sense of who he is as a character in, in a pretty significant way. Um, also, his name is Whitman, so he's he's sort of taking on kind of a Whitman-esque, Whitman-esque tone. Um, let, me, let me go back. Um, oh, do listen me. Um, and not enough sun, but Whitman, ah, seeing, considers suicide every day. So... Um, you know, it gives you a lot about his character, especially, and that's it's a very deeply character-based text, and with a lot of a lot of sort of manic prose, um, and it establishes all that right in the front first sentence. But it's that basic stimulating impulse of you know somebody being in danger. You know, Tripmaster Monkey Whitman Asin, um is in danger, and you know you want to know why he's in danger, try to get him out of danger. Not not really knowing much about him doing that really bare minimum to get you really invested in the character um, and driving you to, you know, want to help him out. Um, even though he's kind of manic and crazy. So, you know, you're drawn in, but you're sort of at a distance. But that's also paralleling the whole idea that um, he committed suicide every day. So, you know, clearly he has some serious depressive tendencies, but, you know, he... he um, you know, has has no real follow through. Um, not not something to laugh about, but just the whole day that he does it every day. You know, maybe one day he'll succeed. What's really stopping him from doing it? Is he really in danger? Is there some other significant probably? Is there some other significant factor going on? But you know, it really draws you in partly through the you know unusual syntax, sort of like um, you know the unusual word choice, the the repetition, the you know, deconstruction of words, that sort of thing. Um, sort of like in water, Watermelon Sugar, where it's not just, you know, you know, Kafka would will usually pretty directly say what the plot is. Um, the plot. Um, this guy's turned into an insect. Um, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston is just fiddling around with the way the words fit together. To give you a lot of sense of the character, but also to set up expectations about how the, how the prose is going to develop. This is last report of the miracles of little no horse. Last report, I was doing the wrong preposition. Last report on the miracles of little no horse uh, by Louise Erdrich, and this is one that I'm writing a book called Murder Birds, and this is one that I go to for 
Louis Erd it's it's sort of I call it my riff on Louis Erdrich, but it's um this this particular book especially. Um but um it has a good opening line. <laughs> um but the opening line, um this is one where the opening I mean this is something I always have to consider. Um the opening chapter is called Naked Woman Playing Chopin. <laughs> that in and of itself um, is uh, that sort of illusion of, of saying, why is she a naked woman playing Chopin? All of that is, you know, all of those impulses pulling against each other. Um, no, no, uh, no pun intended there. Um, Eighty-some years previous. And so they, they, these two are working together, you know, in some, some significant ways. Eighty-some years previous, uh, through a town that was to flourish and past a farm that would disappear, the river slid. All that happened began with a flow of water. So, you know, there's a danger there. There's a very natural sort of danger of flooding. Um, but she's also saying um, that that was the beginning of everything else. And so um, you have that, that impulse. You have that illusion of saying the start of everything else what is the everything else you know the nature of the book if you want to fill in the blanks of and try to figure out what the everything else is the everything else is the book um there's that that impulse of danger and wanting you know just meeting a character you still have that you know automatic sort of grace period of wanting the character to succeed before you even know who, who the character is so the character is in danger you also have that parataxis with the, the title, Naked Woman Playing Chopin, and then there's a flood. So what in the world? How do those fit together? Let me, you know, try to figure out, you know, the connection between those things. Um, but it's Ag Agnes DeWitt, another one of my favorite characters, Agnes DeWitt. Very, com very, very complicated character. Um, but my last one for the morning, the sun is definitely not going to rise behind me. One of these days I'm going to... Maybe I'll come back to some more opening lines um, and have an actual sun rising behind me. It's very, very overcast. Right? Everything is wet uh, out here and it's very overcast. So I, most of what I grab from my A shelf is highfalutin literary fiction, magical realism type of stuff. Um, uh, modernism, postmodernism beat type of stuff. Um, but this is also on my A shelf, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Um, it's a book I, I do love, um, um, and it was inspiration for my story, Fader in the Living Moon, which was part of the Metacarpals novel. I wrote, as I was reading this, I wrote that part of Metacarpals, um, partly because the title is perfect for me, Simon versus the Homo Sapiens Agenda. Um, and Becky Albertalli um, is very popular on BookTube a couple of years ago. Um, Becky, Becky Albertalli signed it. I actually did. I was actually there when she signed it, unlike Maxine Hong Kingston. I was not there. But she said, For Simon, thanks for being Simon's straight soulmate, main character Simon. Um, he comes out of the closet. And I told Becky Albertalli, I, I, <laughs> I relate very well to Simon, except you know, te technically being straight. I'm sorry that, you know, <laughs> technically I'm straight. Um, pure technicality. Um, but everything else <laughs> is very, very, uh, very relatable um, to the you know the Simon in the book. Um, but the first line, and this is actually. It's a weirdly subtle conversation, is you know the first line, um, but the the second line, you know, arguably does a lot of the same things. It's a weirdly subtle conversation. I almost don't notice I'm being blackmailed. So you know, of course, that's um, you know that that sort of elision. You know, before you even meet the character, you have that sort of automatic grace period of of being concerned for the character's safety. You know, we know the character's name from the title, Simon. Beautiful, wonderful name. <laughs> He's fighting the Homo Sapiens agenda, um, which is a much better title than the movie title. Um, 
but um, that's all I really know. I mean, you can you can certainly consider the interaction between titles and um, chapter titles and things like that. But other than that, we don't know anything about him, but he's being blackmailed. Um, there's that parataxis of, it was a subtle conversation. You know, this casual conversation turns into blackmail. Um, so you have, you know, mild sort of parataxis. You have the elision of, you know, what is the conversation that drives me to want to know what this conversation was? How was it subtle? How does it lead to blackmail? Does it represent danger from this character I just met. I already feel empathetic for. It's up to the writer to sustain that empathy, but that automatic grace period empathy right at the beginning of just meeting the character, how does how does Becky Alvitale sustain that that sort of empathetic experience? Um, so yeah, and it's a YA book, you know, I, I don't like the genre. Categorization is, tends to be counterproductive, but you know, if you, if you're reading Simon vs. the Homo Sapien Agendas, you're looking at, you know, high school story of, you know, friendship and, you know, there's romance and all kinds of stuff. Um, so you have the expectations of what is going to happen in the story. But even in, you know, different, very different genres, you know, um, genres, um, you know, Simon vs. the Homo Sapien Agenda is, um, you know, technically different genre than, you know, 100 Years of Solitude or whatever. But it's really effective opening line because it's doing a lot of the same sort of things uh, that 100 Years of Solitude is doing. But anyway, The Disappointing Absence of the Sun. That would be a good title. The Disappointing Absence of the Sun. <laughs> That's a positive way to open up October, the first morning in October. Um, but anyway, it seems like it's going to be a lovely October. This is kind of right for October, actually. Um, but anyway, I'll see you on the next episode.